So um, we're going to move into the first session, which is making the case for the clinical genomics informatics research strategy. And so um, we have two co-moderators that will that will address this, uh, help address this session. Our co-moderators for this meeting will be Dr. Rich Chisholm and Dr. Uh, Lucila Ono Machado. Uh, Dr. Chisholm is a uh, is a uh, Adam and Richard T. Lynn Professor of Medical Genetics in the Finberg School of Medicine, and also the Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology and Surgery at Northwestern University. Uh, he's the founding director of, of the Center for Gen Genetic Medicine, and is also the Vice Dean for Scientific Affairs at the Finberg School and Associate Vice President for Research at Northwestern University. Uh, his research focuses on genomics and bioinformatics and precision medicine, and he leads Northwestern's biobank efforts, New Gene, uh, which enrolls research participants in a study focused on investigating genetic contributions to human disease, uh, therapeutic outcomes, and gene environment interactions. Dr. Lucilla Ono Machado is an associate dean for informatics and information and technology, and the founding chair of the University of California San Diego's Health Department of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, where she leads a group of faculty with diverse backgrounds in medicine, nursing, informatics, and computer science. She's also the PI for the California Precision Medicine Consortium for the All, for the All of Us Research Program. And Dr. Ono Machado's research focus on privacy, uh, it focuses on privacy preserving distributed analytics for healthcare and biomedical sciences. Uh, Dr. Chisholm, Dr. Ono Machado, thank you for being our co-chairs for our first session, and I'll have you introduce the panel discussants for this. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to uh, help moderate this session. Uh, Rex will do that while I will introduce the speakers. Uh, first, the one who needs no introduction is co-chair of this meeting, uh, Dr. Mark Williams, who is a medical geneticist, professor and director of emeritus of Geisinger's Genomic Medicine Institute. He served as PI for eMERGE projects and, and he leads the EHR work group of ClinGen currently. He's in the board of directors of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and interested in genetic services, economic evaluation and implementation. So he will review the survey that was conducted prior to this meeting. Uh, the other speaker will be Dr. Casey Overby Taylor. She is assistant professor of medicine in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine with joint appointments in informatics, computer science and public health. She was previously co-chair of the EHR Integration work, Working Group of eMERGE and recently awarded NHGRI's Genomic Innovation Award, uh, recognizing her research in developing and evaluation methods to incorporate genomic results in, in clinical decision support. She will talk about the technical desiderata for genomic clinical decision support, reflecting on implementation. And lastly, we have Dr. Janina Jeff, a population geneticist, bioinformatician, activist, and educator. She's senior bioinformatics scientist at Illumina, where she develops pipelines for content annotation, selection, and design of population-specific genome-wide content for Illumina's genotyping array. She's one of the top 100 influential African-Americans by The Root Magazine and author of In Those Genes, an international award-winning podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories of African descended Americans through the lens of black culture. She will be talking on inherent racism and in, uh, that induces bias in algorithm development and can implementation of genetic information in clinical informatics decision-making be any different? So please welcome our distinguished speakers. Great, thank you, Lucilla. Thank you, Rex, I appreciate it. Um, I also uh, wanted to thank uh, Dr. Green for presenting the strategic plan. Um, I would note that this is the first genomic medicine uh, meeting uh, post strategic plan. So one of the things that Ken and I will be doing is to try and map some of the takeaways uh, from this meeting to the strategic plan. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight um, was to, um, I say that we really took very seriously the uh, NHGRI's commitment to diversity and have tried to um, uh, have the presenters reflect uh, that commitment to diversity. I think we're fortunate uh, in informatics uh, that we do have a very diverse work group. And so uh, we've been very intentional about trying to make sure uh, that we have that reflected in the presenters that you'll be seeing today and tomorrow. 
So with that, uh, let me uh, go ahead and launch into my presentation here. Um, the objectives for my presentation are to present and discuss the survey results. And first of all, thank you for all of you that took the time to uh, complete that survey. We find that to be very helpful in terms of uh, framing the meeting and also helping to uh, uh, give information to presenters that uh, makes their presentations more relevant to the objectives of the meeting itself. We also have the opportunity to compare um, uh, results to a prior meeting, GM7, that was focused on genomic clinical decision support. Um, we also had a phenomenal number of written comments that came in as part of the survey. We've um, not done a formal thematic analysis, but uh, I have extracted some themes that seem to be recurrent, and we hope that this will set the stage for the rest of the meeting. So we invited 83 um, uh, attendees to participate in the survey and we had 33 responses, which gives us a response rate of just under 40%, which is really quite uh, good for a survey of this nature. And uh, importantly, of those that did respond, all of them completed the survey and provided extensive written comments. Now, um, these are the eight questions uh, that we use to frame this meeting. And I'm not going to go through these questions, but I thought it was really interesting as I looked at the visual to see where the responses clustered. Uh, and you can see uh, somewhat unusually for a, um, a Likert scale that we had a lot of responses in neither agree nor disagree, uh, disagree and strongly disagree. Uh, with a smattering up to agree and strongly agree. Um, this is informative in the sense that I think it is an endorsement that we're on the right track for the topic of this meeting, which is uh, there's a lot of opportunity for research um, uh, around these uh, types of questions as reflected by this. And I wanted to just uh, pull out a couple of ones that I thought were particularly um, useful uh, at least when I was thinking about it. The first um, is to look at the mean uh, response rate across these eight questions. And you can see here uh, that this numerically reflects uh, what we saw on the prior uh, slide where the responses are really ranging between about uh, two and four. So in this uh, middle range, but in particular uh, question five, um, and question six, uh, I thought were uh, very interesting. So question five uh, are the methods for integrating analytical interpretations are well-established. And a four here is uh, consistent with a disagree. Um, and you can see that the range was only between three and five. So essentially neutral to strongly disagree. Um, the question six then is the genomic medicine community will benefit from having a revised technical desiderata. And here we had uh, a mean that was uh, on the agree with a range that uh, was between strongly agree and uh, mildly uh, disagree. So um, again, I think that uh, was very useful to look at those sort of extremes of response. Um, there's also a, a tremendous amount of variability uh, across uh, the different questions, um, which is again, somewhat unusual for um, uh, uh, questions of, of this nature, uh, but very little variability actually across question five. So this ra raises uh, an initial point to me of whether or not this question five uh, really is a frame for a research priority. Um, so we'll come back to that um, tomorrow after we've had a chance to absorb all of the rest of the presentations. Now, in October 2014, as I mentioned, we had a genomic medicine meeting, Genomic Medicine 7, which I was um, pleased to co-chair with uh, Blackford Middleton, who unfortunately was unable to participate uh, in um, our uh, GM13 uh, conference. Uh, but the focus was on genomic clinical decision support, so a much more narrow um, a focused meeting than what we're currently experiencing. Now, we did a survey prior to that meeting as well. And uh, we used as a basis for that uh, 14 desiderata, uh, seven that were published by 
uh, Dan Macy's and colleagues on um, desiderata to support genomic medicine in the electronic health record. And then a follow-up uh, uh, publication by uh, Brandon Welch and uh, colleagues uh, that looked at technical desiderata around genomic clinical decision support. Now, in the GM7 meeting, we queried on two different scales. What was the importance of a given element? And what was the gap between the current state and the ideal future state of that particular element? But we also asked the attendees of that meeting to prioritize the elements. Now, for this meeting, GM13, we uh, essentially asked people to agree or disagree with the desiderata, which is really more uh, similar to the importance of a given element. So while they're not directly comparable, I think we can still um, take a look at this and, and draw some conclusions. Now, this was the uh, mean element importance, and uh, we did score this like golf, where the lower the score, the more important the element uh, is and the orange bar reflects the standard deviation. So you can see a, a lot of variability across these, but this did give us a rank order of these questions. And so what I've done for comparison is to really uh, just do uh, from most to least uh, important uh, across the two meetings. And then I have pulled out a couple of questions to really focus on. Um, Number eight was scored the highest at, uh, for uh, attendees from both GM7 and GM13, which is that clinical decision support knowledge must have the potential to incorporate multiple genes and clinical information related to those multiple genes. And I think that that is something that we'll need to kind of keep at the center uh, of um, what we talk about over the course of the next two days. Now, the uh, number 10 was also in the top five. It didn't score uh, near the top, but it certainly was represented in the top five for both meetings, which is clinical decision support knowledge must have the capacity to support multiple electronic health record platforms with various data representations with minimal modification. So those were the two that sort of maintained uh, a priority. Now, as we look at things that have changed, there were several that changed from a relatively low priority to a high priority between uh, GM7 and 13. One is to leverage current and developing CDS and genomic standards. My interpretation of why this has moved up is because at the time of GM7, there were almost no uh, standards for either clinical decision support or genomics. Now we actually are seeing standards emerging in both areas. So we're able now to actually use these standards um, as they're becoming more common in clinical practice. The next um, desiderata that moved from low to high was to maintain the linkage of molecular observations to the laboratory methods used to generate them. And I think this reflects um, a, a standardization of techniques uh, in the laboratory uh, that have become more standardized and that uh, we are uh, reflecting more on the importance with the different techniques about what the particular method actually has to say about the molecular observation. And making sure that that information is available at the point of care is critically important for interpretation. And you can see that that ranks now as the second highest priority uh, for attendees of this meeting. And then the third one, and this is really interesting to me because we spent a lot of time at GM7 talking about this idea of the separation of the primary molecular observation from the clinical interpretation. And we spent a lot of time trying to define what we actually meant by that. Well, now this is becoming, uh, again, almost axiomatic that um, the clinical interpretation really is a different process from the molecular observation. Uh, and it's critically important to reflect both of those areas. Now we had a couple that moved from a high priority down to a low priority, which again, I think reflects uh, how the field has changed over the intervening years. One is to support a CDS knowledge base deployed it and developed by multiple independent organizations. Um, this, I, the fact that this moved down, I don't think reflects that we don't think it's important, but we uh, now understand just how incredibly hard it is to do this. Um, and so uh, uh, this may not be achievable, at least in our current electronic health record environment. And then lastly, um, 
the uh, need to support human viewable formats and machine readable formats to facilitate implementation decision support rules. This moved low, I think because we've actually uh, accomplished a fair amount in the intervening years to support this human readable and machine readable uh, formatting. Now, I stole this directly from the strategic vision, so Eric knows that at least one person has read it besides his staff. Um, and I think this is special relevance for number seven, uh, which is a desiderata to support both individual clinical care and discovery science. Now, it's interesting that this was ranked as number two in GM7 and was ranked sort of in the middle for GM11. But I would hold that this is a really critical piece because it absolutely uh, is reflected in this diagram, which is uh, the idea that we need to create this, uh, these virtual cycles that takes basic genomics research, moves it into a genomic learning healthcare system, and also sends uh, knowledge from there back into the basic genomics research. So this is an area where, again, I think is um, a good opportunity. There were a couple of additional themes that emerged from the free text, the importance of assessing stakeholder preference and workflow, sustainability of resources, um, lack of methods for evaluation of innovation implementation, and the impact of consent and a regulatory framework. So my takeaways in terms of the implications for the research agenda is that this is a target-rich environment. We've got a lot to do in genomics and informatics. Um, there are persisting priorities over the last five years, but there's uh, some of these priorities have also changed. Uh, and that research needs to include attention to the stakeholder engagement and workflow evaluation, the development of rigorous evaluation methods, uh, consideration of a policy and regulatory environment research agenda, and sustainability. Um, so uh, the full survey results, including all of the comments, are included in the, in the meeting materials. And so uh, as you review those, please contact uh, Ken or myself if you have comments on our interpretation. As I mentioned, each speaker has received narrative comments from the survey that are relevant, relevant to their topic and has been asked to reflect on those uh, in their presentations and always keep the overarching impl impl implications in mind uh, during our discussion. So with that, I will end my formal presentation and turn it back over to the moderators. Thanks, Mark, and great job keeping on time. We can ask for clarifying questions if anyone has one, and while you, there, I didn't see any in the Q&A, but Mark, maybe you could just uh, comment. It seems to me that there is a little bit of a mismatch between um, number three, which was maintaining the link of the methods, and number one, uh, separation of the primary molecular interpretation. That, that seems a little in conflict. Yeah, I think that's an area where um, uh, we need to um, uh, explore a little bit uh, what we actually mean by um, uh, these two things. I think the way I interpret this is that the molecular observation in some ways represents uh, the raw output of whatever we're doing, whether it's a genome or an exome or a panel or whatever. There's then a molecular interpretation. In other words, if we see a variant in a given gene, um, uh, is that uh, pathogenic? Uh, is it uh, uncertain? Is it benign? Uh, and then that uh, transforms into um, a, a clinical observation, which is it may be a pathogenic variant in a gene, but from a clinical perspective, if that gene is not associated with a disease that fits uh, the uh, clinical presentation, then it may not be of clinical relevance, even though it looks to be a pathogenic variant. So in, in the graphic that we created for the meeting, we have this data to knowledge to wisdom um, a rubric which I think is, um, you know, encompasses all of those different areas. And I think there's uh, been a lot of work through a lot of the programs that NHGRI funds to begin to sort out this sort of thing, but there still remains a lot of work to do. Uh, and that's certainly been a major focus of some of the efforts of uh, the clinical genome resource, for example, uh, to try and uh, answer these questions and provide the information that's needed for implementation. 
Okay, thanks, Mark. I, I'm not seeing any other questions and we'll have uh, plenty of time for discussion. Uh, so let me uh, move to our next speaker, who's Casey Overby Taylor. Casey, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name is Casey Overby Taylor, and I'm going to be talking about the technical desiderata for genomic clinical decision support. And this is a very good follow on to uh, Mark Williams' present presentation on the, um, on the desiderata because they were ranked in terms of priorities, but uh, I'll be giving some examples from uh, my experiences within uh, one network uh, that's funded by the NHGRI. And it, it also uh, provides some context for what people are also thinking about when they answer uh, these uh, surveys, because uh, what's ranked is reflective of, of the people who are involved in, um, in answering those uh, questions. Um, my involvement in eMERGE uh, has, has been as the EHR integration workgroup co-chair uh, from 2015 to, to early last year uh, with Sandy Aronson. And, and so this is just uh, one example. And I was asked specifically to talk about our current state for adjusting technical desiderata uh, for the integration of genomic data in the EHR also considerations for the genomic medicine community to revise the desiderata, and then areas where the research strategy developed by NHGRI could be useful to achieve the goals described by the desiderata. So first to just give very um, brief overview of, uh, of eMERGE. So this is uh, an overview of the strategy used by uh, nine clinical sites and two genomic laboratory results. Uh, to return results from genomic sequencing using clinical reports and also the raw data that could be used for discovery. So this is kind of that uh, the beginning of uh, the, the cycle that uh, Mark brought up in terms of uh, supporting both uh, clinical use and discovery through reporting in repositories like dbGaP. One of the main goals for this uh, effort in the third phase was to integrate genetic variants into the EHR. And so when we compare with, uh, when we compare with uh, the desiderata, the first part of the desiderata, um, we see that this strategy uh, first maintains separation between the primary molecular observations and the clinical interpretations of this, those data through the reporting process of having the reports and the raw data separate. Um, it also supported the compact representation of actionable subsets in those reports. And it supports both the individual clinical care and discovery science, as I, as I mentioned previously. Um, to keep in mind also, uh, the, you know, the, the feeding back within the clinical system is a piece that wasn't necessarily uh, covered within this uh, infrastructure. So how we, how we define what we mean by these uh, questions will probably come out during this meeting as well. And digging down a little bit more into the architecture for how genomic re results are returned, uh, I'll just draw your attention to a couple of areas uh, related to the desiderata. The second um, point about supporting lossless data compression uh, within the infrastructure, there were the, the raw BAM VCF files that were maintained. Um, and then there were also the st structured genomic uh, result uh, for return, the structure within an XML format, which is this human readable uh, and also machine readable format. And digging into this structured uh, sequencing reports, this is uh, a, a more detail of what sections are actually included in the report and uh, relevant to the uh, desiderata. So the, the third. Um, the third point to maintain the linkage between observations and lab methods, the report includes information about lab methods. And then the fourth point uh, around uh, including the actionable subsets we see, uh, for example, the patient interpretation of the disease was one particular section from that report. And then the sixth point to anticipate fundamental changes, there is a portion in the report around uh, in interpretation revision. So this is a, a format that could uh, enable all of these, uh, these uh, data information to be included with the reports itself. Uh, another important factor of, of eMERGE is that 
Uh, they spent a lot of time harmonizing items across sequencing centers. And uh, by doing this, this was both um, the reports and processes that were relevant for genomic clinical decision support. Um, when we look at the decision support capabilities, um, we were, uh, by, by doing this harmonization, there is, uh, there's potential for multiple genes and, and clinical information to, to be supported. So this is because the scenarios uh, that were uh, focused on within eMERGING included uh, reporting from variants on uh, 67 genes and 14 SNVs. Um, in order to keep the knowledge separate from very classification, um, they, uh, they, they maintained that knowledge so that they were able to have ongoing classifications uh, within the network. So the, because of these scenarios that were being supported in eMERGE, um, they had, uh, the labs in particular had to come up with um, the infrastructure to support this and harmonize these, um, these items. Uh, in, in addition, uh, there was support for in addition to support for a large number of gene variants while simplifying the, the decision support knowledge um, by having this XML structure uh, that contains some decision, what could be considered decision support knowledge so that um, variants, uh, variant associated phenotypes could be uh, considered um, decision support if you're able to add that to a problem list of a patient, for example. And then this uh, number 13, which is uh, providing a knowledge base that can be deployed at multiple ind independent organizations. I think this entire process of coming up with uh, consensus around these different reporting and, and, and processes uh, within the network uh, is something that allows for deployment across the, the network uh, because it's adhering to a specific standard. Um, so beyond the initial scope of eMERGE 3, we went on to, uh, some of us uh, did a pilot project where we were, uh, where there was harm, where there was first mapping the XML style report to an HL7 fire standard. And that, and this just shows uh, you know, a snapshot of uh, what came out of that mapping process showing uh, that uh, there are portions of the report that might that were mapped to the um, the fire standard, and a, a, an enormous amount of work went into this process. Uh, when we look at the remaining items from the desiderata, uh, this by leveraging this standard, we would be able to address this. Uh, the portion that I was involved in with um, Luke Rasmussen um, was in demonstrating the potential for decision support, and so a lot of that was. Uh, Focusing on a, you know specific um, portions of the report that could be used for decision support, so that include included the medical implement implication as well as the uh, um, as well as the the di the um, variant associated phenotypes, which is not shown in this picture. So, uh, in terms of the desiderata, by using this standard. Uh, the knowledge would have the capacity to support multiple EHR platforms because vendors are now uh, enabling web services that could uh, that could be able to read data that's in a fire format. And so, uh, by doing that, if the if the EHR vendors um, allow for access to allow uh, allow for access to data in those formats, then we can leverage that in multiple platforms. Also, uh, we can um, leverage, we're leveraging current and, de and developing CDS. Um, there, there's, of course, additional phases in making this, uh, uh, this clinical genomics uh, FHIR standard uh, in the um, approve, approval process that has to take place in order for it to be used broadly. But this is a, a pretty strong step in the, in the right direction. And then finally, access to transmit only genomic information necessary for decision support. Ideally, we would be able to leverage the APIs if they're supported by the EHRs to be able to um, pull genomic information directly. And um, in, in our experience, uh, we were able to, to do that to a limited, uh, to a, a limited um, amount, uh, but this is, again, a very good starting point to be able to do this.
So now I'll move on to the second topic of considerations for revising uh, technical desiderata. And um, there are two experiences that I wanna just describe from the EHR integration work group. One is we had monthly virtual work group meetings where uh, at some point we had uh, the sites report on the lessons learned that they had and also best practices for implementing genomic decision support. And then second, we had uh, one exercise at a meeting in um, June of 2019 where we brainstormed some potential hazards related to uh, implementation of genomic decision support. And so we focused uh, particularly on alert-based decision support and in two, two areas, pharmacogenomics alerts on drug orders and new variant knowledge updates to previous results, because the second bullet was a, a large area of focus for the labs that were uh, involved in the network. And uh, just wanted to highlight that alerts and reminders are just one type of decision support. And in our conversation, uh, we might also be consider other types of uh, decision support too. And then another area of focus was, uh, was around the architecture. So we considered both uh, ancillary genomic systems and EHR-centered management. Um, ancillary genomic uh, systems kept the, the genomic data in a separate system, similar to uh, a LIMS, um, and the EHR would only uh, be presenting the interpretations that were um, provided from that system. And then for the EHR centered management example, this is from an example that Mayo, public, Mayo published, where they used genomic indicators that were part of the EHR itself. And so that's uh, an example where the vendor can uh, has provided functionality to be able to manage genomic knowledge. And so focusing on uh, the, the, the last uh, row here in this um, graph, uh, we saw that there was a mix in eMERGE in terms of which uh, sites wanted, were leveraging EHR only versus ancillary omics system. And then there was were uh, four sites that were both uh, EHR and ancillary and two sites that were neither. So this is among 12 institutions that were involved in the network. And uh, we also captured the characteristics of uh, implementation among eMERGE uh, in terms of uh, three dimensions. Uh, first was timing, whether it was prior to genomic testing um, or so the kinds of uh, guidance on when to test or, or when to use uh, genomic results as part of their uh, as part of a clinical decision, um, and then post decisions post test decision support, which was, um, for example, upon ordering a medication, uh, saying that uh, um, uh, upon ordering a medication, notifying uh, the clinician. Um, that they should that they should that they should use test results that are available for them. So it's um, uh, those are kind of the two uh, contexts. So when to test and after testing, and then uh, for uh, delivery, there's passive where you have to actively uh, review the just review the decision support versus active, which we're, we're often referring to as interruptive alerts. Um, where you might stop a, a clinical action from happening given the data that's available on a patient. And then context where op op opportunistic is an area that all sites in eMERGE uh, were participating in because that's, um, you know, in, uh, for testing that's used for research purposes, uh, having, a sec having a secondary uh, finding being returned to a patient was kind of the, the scenario. And then for uh, three of the sites that we surveyed, they were doing both opportunistic and population, where population, um, it, it could be a healthy individual who's getting genomic sequencing so that the results could help to uh, help to in, inform ways to prevent future, uh, uh, future risk of, um, of disease. So uh, in our results, we saw that five were doing post-test only, uh, and that's a mix, uh, sorry, all, all, all of the sites were doing um, pre, uh, were doing post-test, but then a, half, a subset were doing both pre and post. And then for delivery, uh, both were doing um, passive and active decision support at seven sites, where two were only doing active and one was doing passive. And then in the, um, for context, again, uh, everybody was doing, all of the sites were doing opportunistic with three sites doing population. So uh, uh, 
one area, so now that you have the context for where for the people who were um, involved in their activities within the EHRI integration work group, um, for we so initially we found that um, many of the sites had some unique experiences in terms of the implementation best practices and lessons. And so what we ended up doing was uh, was uh, creating a venue for the the sites to be able to publish their case studies of how they implemented decision support. And um, really uh, last year they started to publish these, they've been kind of rolling out the case reports of, this, of the sites who, um, who submitted uh, details about their implementation as part of the network. And so these are lessons that are shared and can be drawn from. Uh, second, we did uh, this hazard analysis at a, at, at a meeting last year where it resulted in us understanding a few things uh, that could impact being able to implement de genomic decision support, uh, inappropriate alert firing, uh, context, technical issues, user experience problems, knowledge management are four of the themes that came out of this. And so we might be able to uh, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, what, what we found is that more in-depth hazard analysis exercise Exercises are needed to really flesh out, like what are the um, what are the what's the severity of some of these issues that came up, or there may be additional issues, and then also um, which uh, which level of risk is acceptable. So being able to really assess those aspects. AC one minute warning. Okay, thank you. And so just. Um, so just uh, to summarize, so we have these case series articles, there's other articles that, that report lessons learned. And so one suggestion might be to do a content analysis of these articles to figure out like what are really the, the common challenges across groups. And then in terms of a uh, um, hazard analysis, uh, we'll be able to get into many of the implementation challenges at this, um, at, at this um, meeting, but we may also want to uh, expand further in a larger, an HGRI workshop. And so I'm out of time, so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Casey, uh, great summary. Um, I, I think we'll save most of the questions for discussion, but maybe just to uh, highlight one that was asked in the chat. Uh, do you have any sense whether uh, there's gonna be differences in implementation of these desiderata in different environments, for example, urban versus rural health settings? Uh, yes, I mean, we just, we found within, uh, within eMERGE that every, every site, um, even though we had this common infrastructure uh, for reporting that the, the implementation ended up being different. So uh, if we're considering rural versus, um, uh, like those kinds of settings, the context may be different. So one example is for um, uh, when uh, pretest, uh, when genetics is relevant for different scenarios may be different. And so uh, how you implement uh, will be different. So for for uh, warfarin um, testing is more helpful in some in some cases in rural settings uh, to be able to get to the right dose for a patient much quicker than uh, a site that might be able to um, monitor a patient more more closely and make adjustments quickly. Uh, so for for that, when you provide the decision support, that timing aspect may be different. Thank, thanks, Casey. I think that actually sort of highlights uh, our transition to the next step, the importance to pay attention to diversity as we think about uh, this broad environment. So I'll invite uh, Janina to give her presentation. The floor is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I am giving a very, very, very quick talk on inherent racism and how it induces bias and algorithm development. So I'll speak very broadly at first, and then I'll talk a little bit more about genetics, still very broadly. So I do wanna go ahead and start off with a big disclosure that this is just a glimpse of information um, that's really just digestible given this time constraint. I honestly can and am writing a whole book on things like this. 
So by any means, this is not a complete thing. I also want to uh, also say that this is not a reflection of my work at Illumina, nor does it reflect the beliefs of Illumina uh, or my work there as a scientist specifically. So this is outside of the realms of what I do at Illumina, which I do speak about, but not today. So let's talk about um, how race influences algorithm development. And so this is an example of a commercial software compass that was used in Florida. And really what they were trying to do is predict the risk of a group being re-arrested. And so this was used by a judge um, before trial for people who were being convicted to, to determine their sentences, but also to determine the likelihood of them um, being a repeat offender. In this case, they, they looked at these two groups. Let's just say one is blue and one is purple. And these were the training data. They made these assumptions based off of previous data that three people in the blue group would be uh, repeat offenders or rearrested versus six people in the purple group. What's really interesting about this is that the people who developed this algorithm say that this was considered to be predictive parity, which would mean that even in the case when we are making these predictions and there's an underlying assumption that there are more people in one group who would be more likely to develop a certain outcome, that the rate of false positive and false negatives would also be the same. But what's really unique about this, uh, this particular algorithm is that that is not true. What you actually see is an overrepresentation. In fact, in the blue group, one person um, out of the seven was misidentified as being high risk for being rearrested, whereas almost half of the people in the purple group were more likely to be false positive. And so the false positive rates are not equal. And so this becomes extremely problematic, mostly because what is not being accounted for here is that by using these training inputs um, that we're not accounting for race as being a confounding variable, in this case being blue or purple. And we also are not accounting for the likelihood of the fact that the false positive rates is higher in one group which is probably speaking to what begins with, which is that the purple group might have already been unfairly targeted for arrest in the first place. And so this is just one example of how, you know, accurately predicting data from the past could be harmful in predicting data in the future. This is one example, but this is one of many examples where we see inherently racist algorithms being used in the criminal justice system. To a, greater, to a different extent, we see this, there have been robots show that beauty contests that use algorithms will you know, disproportionately select winners who are white versus those who have darker skin. Um, earlier last summer, when we all started getting on Zoom, a lot of people were complaining that when they did Zoom virtual backgrounds, that in fact, their, their face would disappear if they were darker skin. And you also see some AI like Google Maps that have glitches in the way that they read certain words. For example, Malcolm X Boulevard is called Malcolm 10 Boulevard. So there's a lot of um, bias already in a lot of systems that we have. How does this look for clinical informatics? And this might be something, um, this might be something that you guys have seen already, but one of the, one of the largest, um, examples of commercial risk prediction that's used over 200 million people in the US really targets patients for, for high uh, risk care management. And so the purpose of this tool is to be able to predict patients who will require additional attention for complex health needs before the situation becomes too, too dire uh, or too needed. And so those who are over 55% are defaulted into this program. Those who are less than 55% are, are referred to screen by a physician and those who are 97% or higher are automatically enrolled into this program. What I'm showing, on, what is showing on the, the left hand panel here is the total medical expenditure. And this is really important because if we look at these two groups, black and white, and we look at this algorithm risk prediction, which is based off of um, insurance type, diagnosis, procedure codes, medications, everything, even you know, age and sex, except ironically it exclu excludes race. 
when we look at these two, we see that the total medical expenditure between the two groups is not different given the algorithmic, algorithmic risk score. But what the authors here found is that this algorithm risk score is not taking into account how sick the patients were. In fact, there was a lot of bias that was only looking at the amount of the medical expenses, which are also disproportionate between these two groups. So how did we get here? How did we get to the point where we have so much inherent racism in all of these algorithms, where it be in the medical field or whether it be in the beauty industry? And one of the ways in which I believe that we got here is because one of the foundations of everything we do is funded on the principles of racism. And so for those of you who don't know, I have a podcast called In Those Genes, which is a podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories and futures of African descendants. And we recently started our second season. Our second season is all centered around um, what is truly genetic. And really the purpose of our show is to, in somewhat of a documentary and educational format, break down genetic concepts using Black culture and hip hop. In this particular clip that I'm playing though, uh, I talked to Delon Justinville, who's a biocultural anthropologist and a sociologist, Dr. Saida Grundy. And the whole episode is focused, in, is focused on how race became about. So it's a journey of how race started. But this particular clip speaks to um, how racism initially started with genetics and in genetics. As defined by Galton, Eugenics was the study of all agencies under human control, which can improve or impair the racial quality of future generations. And the goal was to have superior humans mate with one another to breed out inferior humans. He was a racist who was trying to kill off all non-white people. And there was a bunch of people on board openly identifying as eugenists. But then in the early 20th century, when real life science, that is genetics, rose around, a shift happens. Very many departments, programs, institutions, and even professorships of genetics today, they just renamed from like this institution's department of eugenics became this institution's department of genetics. This professor of eugenics became this professor of genetics. So all this genetics is trash? We got to cancel the whole show? Um, so while genetics itself, I would not argue, is racist, these theorists and practitioners maintained former practices and ways of thought. Science is as socially and politically constructed as any other field. What all of these colonialism era, you know, European empire era thinkers and scientists et cetera, show us is that really all of these disciplines can be corrupted to make really wrong assessments in the service of European white supremacy. And so that's just the clip. And I think when I was first making this episode, I was really caught off guard by how much I learned being in this field for over 15 years now. But then I started to learn that like, this is not something of our past. This is actually something that is still very much so with us today. And I would say even more so a part of computational genomics, which is my expertise. And so one example of this is Carl Pearson, who is the creator of the chi-square test, p-value and principal component analysis, something that I use very often as a population geneticist. And he is also the person who justified eugenics in the annals, annuals of eugenics, which is a journal, a peer-reviewed journal at the time that was used to justify a lot of eugenic theories. Now the name is just simply changed to the annals of human genetics. And then you also see other examples like Galton, who is the founder of eugenics, who was also the person who developed the regression to the mean concept, which was then called the regression to mediocrity. So I can't help but ask this question, if we have such a dark past that is inherently, you know, fueled by racism in eugenics, is there hope for us to change this? And most importantly, is it hope for us to change this in the context of participant uh, engagement, given the, given the history that we have that still sits with us today? And so I show this slide a lot of times as one of my favorite uh, examples where we can see the impact of race in the clinical imp implementation of genetic information. On this left side, I am showing um, genetic variants associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in a paper that was published in 2016. And really what was special about this paper is that it showed these pathogenic variants in these five genes that were supposed to account for 70% of um, the trait variability 
or 70% of the genetic uh, heritability for this particular trait. But when we looked at it in Black Americans, they were being misdiagnosed because the allele frequencies between these two populations were very different. In fact, in African Americans, the allele frequencies were quite common, not the clinical, not the you know typical picture that we see for pathogenic variants in ClinVar. A more recent study conducted showed that when we look at ACMG variants in ClinVar, 11.5% of these have inflation. Um, in these pathogenic in these pathogenic sets, and this inflation gets exacerbated the less information that we have to confirm these clinical these pathogenic variants by studies, by representation, by data, essentially. And so I go back to this question of can we do this? And the answer is maybe. Um, there are some few examples that people who have done this, and as Casey has mentioned, there is a lot of things that are going and happening. One example is going back to the study I had showed earlier with the 200, um, with the algorithm that was classifying based on uh, the number of money that is spent on a patient given how sick they are. Going back to the same paper, if you look at this algorithm risk score, which we know is biased, and we look at the number of chronic conditions, we see that the Black patients are sicker, um, although they are not being able to get put into these programs. And that is because this cost that is associated with this risk score is actually representing the lack of cost that's invested into the Black patients despite them being sicker. This group, once they account for this and recorrect this, show that they can increase the amount of Black participants that would have been enrolled into this very beneficial program by from 17.7 to 46.5% for those who are greater than 97th percentile, meaning they would be automatically put into the program. Likewise, for genetics, going back to this ACMG example, we could see that also taking into account things that we know impact um, genetic variants and disease like population allele frequent, like disease specific population of allele frequency will improve the inflation, but not and fix it. And so taking into account these disease specific frequencies, the inflation now is much smaller. However, this is only made possible because we have to have representation of genetic studies, which is also a manifest manifestation of a different form of racism. In this case, the lack of trust between diverse communities and research communities. Therefore, it's kind of like a, a, a double, you know, a two-edged sword where in the sense that we know that we can improve this with more data. However, we haven't gotten to the fundamentals of why we have these issues, why we have this lack of representation, which we know largely impacts our ability to do this well. Um, another thing that this paper found, which is not so surprising, is that um, one of the burdens was that a lot of these were rare variants. And as we know, rare variants are population specific and most importantly, underrepresented. But I do believe that there is hope. I do believe that we are, we will be able to do this. But I think one thing that we have to kind of remember is that are we ready to do this? And when I say ready, I think it goes beyond how many algorithms can we create to fix it? What it really speaks to is how can we create a new system to build trust, to also fix the issues, the technical issues that are built in with these within these algorithms, which is the work that we're doing, and also um, how can we also include this entire ecosystem of the people who are building the algorithms? And so when people ask the question, what will it take? This slide doesn't do it justice. It's actually an entire ecosystem. But this paper published just last week talks about the one of the issues, and Ruha Benjamin talks about this too, which is that the coded in inequity perpetuated um, is really because of those who design the algorithms and the tools and the people who design these algorithms and tools are not thinking carefully about the systemic racism that underlies them. This is a problem that is, you know, also impacting a lot of diverse scientists. And in this paper, they show that when we look at R01 applications from 2014 to 2016, that the award rate is twofold lower for Black um, black scientists. What's really nice, this paper also goes through the exercise of showing what it would take in order to make things equitable. And according to what it would take, it would only take, uh, <laughs> this little red dot represents what it would take to implement an equity policy given the NIH annual budget. Um, this figure on the, this, this figure, figure B is also showing that if we do a lot of practices like 
making sure we have anti-racist reviewers, we might be able to also increase the retention of Black scientists who are doing this work. As we know, these scientists do have um, extra insight on how we can approach these problems. And again, being able to develop these algorithms is a critical, critical, critical part in one, facilitating um, community engagement, but also into making sure we have less bias in these systems. Um, that's all I have. I, like I said, this is a very, very, very short presentation, but I'll end um, with this last clip from the podcast. Given all that history, how should we engage with genetics, given what we know about it being fundamentally built from racist ideologies? I think that we first and foremost should not shy away from acknowledging exactly that, constantly reflecting on the ways that it still informs, shapes, and contours how we operate today. It's also about understanding that we're more complex than simple scientific measurements. We should hold genetics in tandem with the other ways of thinking about how we understand ourselves. How do we think of the biological alongside of the cultural um, understandings and conceptions that we've always had? You know, how might you think about a genetic ancestry test alongside your family's oral histories? I know I'm way over time, but thank you so much. Thank you. That was really uh, terrific and I think in many ways really eye-opening. Um, I think we'll transition to the broad discussion, but I did just want to give you a chance, Janina, to uh, refer to uh, or to comment on a, a comment put in the chat by Jeff Ginsburg, who raised the broader question of um, how do we think about the construct of race and how that information gets captured in the electronic health record? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that I think I would like to see us move forward, move away from is using race as a term in general. Um, one thing you'll notice throughout the presentation, I had race in quotation marks is because I largely believe the more that we use the word, the more that we are continuing the practice. I think one way that we can start to move away from that is kind of tapping into what we do as scientists, right? We as scientists thrive on numbers and, and quantity. And so if we don't if we don't also uh, engage in that when we recruit people and we put these things into our medical systems, EHRs, then that's one way of eliminating that bias. And I think genetics is a great opportunity for us to make sure that what we're exploring or what we're testing and what we're studying is the genetic architecture and not racism. Those two are two separate things. One of them does impact clinical outcomes, not to say that they're not related, but I think when we communicate this and when we start to talk about it, we just have to make sure that we make sure that those things are separate and that participants understand that as well. Thanks, and at this point, I'll turn back over to Lucilla for the, to moderate the general discussion. Uh, thank you all the panelists. I think it, it's been uh, very enlightening to, to also see the chat going in two directions one which is technical, how do we get this done and implement? And the other one is uh, j just the, the last presentation on how the injustice of, of some practices perpetuate and we are at the risk of, of um, enhancing that. So bo both uh, threads lead to discomfort, discomfort of, of different types. And, and I would ask the, the, the panelists to, uh, discuss exactly that. What kind of information, of genetic information, do you see most helpful to, to include immediately in the electronic health record? And uh, what do you see the, the advantages, disadvantages, and potential perils of having that information be misused? So let, let's uh, start with Mark, then Casey, then Janina. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so um, we've focused our efforts uh, at uh, my institution on uh, the high impact uh, genetic variation. Uh, so looking at a relatively small set of genes uh, where we understand the gene disease uh, relationship well, and where we have a, a reasonable understanding of the mechanism um, 
of variation that can lead to disease and also some information about um, the prevalence of disease that's likely to result from that variation. So in particular, we focused around the CDC tier one conditions, um, BRCA1 and 2, um, uh, Lynch syndrome, and uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so that seems very straightforward, but I think the slide that um, Dr. Jess presented is the one that's really critically important, which is all variants are not understood equally. And while in our population, which is um, a predominantly Northern European, we have very good um, uh, data that can help us to interpret uh, variation uh, pretty effectively. Um, if our population were uh, much more diverse, we would have a dramatic increase in variants that we currently do not understand or might be mis um, uh, annotated as being pathogenic when they're not, which could lead to um, an inordinate amount of harm. So I think the uh, whole point is that even if you focus on something that we think we understand very well, uh, the reality is in the context of um, uh, genetic variation across populations, uh, there's a lot we don't understand and there's a lot that needs to be done to really uh, move that forward. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Casey, your impressions. So I, I guess uh, most, most recently at Hopkins, I've been interacting with the, with the clinical geneticists. And so they, I think it may be, um, you know, different at different sites, but because there are, are quite a few patients that come here for um, genetic diagnosis, uh, one, um, one area that I've been looking into more is reanalysis of exome sequencing over time. And so for um, the genes that we know a lot about, that may be a, a place at least in this setting where we can um, we can really explore explore implementation more fully because it's happening regularly and I think um, I, I think it might be helpful to, to know uh, for those who are doing um, implementation projects what types of uh, genetics um, uh, assessments are being done across institutions to be able to help uh, focus like what's uh, what's appropriate for um, different, different sites and uh, uh, Ken Kamamoto brought up a point about making sure that um, we're not just uh, focusing on those academic institutions that, uh, that are highly resourced. And so um, getting uh, the span of like what, what would be useful for sites that may not be, uh, have the same um, profile as a, as, a, um, as a eMERGE site, for example, would be useful. And Janine, hi. I, I was, oh, I was, I was asking you. Can you repeat the question? I, I missed the question as I was reading comments. Uh, the question was, uh, we we have the ability, technical and um, opportunity to include genetic information in electronic health records. Do you think that has a, a potential danger of uh, biasing, biasing even more what uh, clinical medicine is doing? Okay. Um, I mean, I think we, we see that already, um, but I do think that, again, this is something that's avoidable. Um, I do think it does require the rigorous work of, you know, not just creating algorithms, but testing these algorithms for bias in all the different many ways that you can find it. And in the, in the, in the slide that I showed with the blue and the purple people, uh, one of the reasons why they colored them blue and purple is because they actually didn't even use race. And so we, we see that sometimes, and I think, I think Terry mentioned this, so we see that even when you don't include these things, you still have data that is shaped by these things. And so this begs the question that if all the prior data that we're using to develop the algorithm is already biased, then we're starting at a biased point. That would mean that in order to really eliminate majority of the bias, we would need to kind of start over. And of course, no one wants to start over <laughs> or start to build these things from the beginning, but that is one solution. I mean, I do think that there are some other solutions in there. I don't think that we figured it out. And I think it's a very complicated question that genetics and bringing genetics into um, the equation will not solve. And we probably can avoid it from 
exacerbating the problem. But again, we have to correct for all of the data that we're already using and that it's already biased. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated answer, but I don't know. So if I could just follow up on something that I think is very provocative that um, Dr. Jeff just said, which is the idea that none of us wants to start over, but the focus of this um, meeting is really about you know, research strategies. And so I'm curious if you have some ideas about um, maybe some um, different ways that we could frame research, particularly in genomics and informatics uh, that um, might help us to at least partially restart uh, and uh, set things up on a, a more level playing field. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I really don't have all the answers, but, <laughs> or know really where to start. But I mean, I do think that we've gotten really good at correcting bias in the most, you know, urgent situations, dire situations when needed. If, if COVID-19 is not a good example of that, then I don't know what is. So I know that we are capable of doing it and that we're smart enough to create these, th uh, these ways and these methods. I do think that it'll take a lot more effort than we originally anticipated. I mean, we are already at the point where we know how complicated genetics is and we know how complicated, how it interacts with all the different omics and then social and all these things, right? Um, that level of complexity will still need to be put in place when we start to think about how do we develop these things. So I think it's possible. I think that there are ways in which we can do it. I think it requires a lot of testing, a lot of ridicule, and a lot of data. And I think when we get to the question of the data, which is one that I think we have talked about too much um, without actually exploring the why. So I say too much because for a lot of my career, I've always heard we need my we need more diversity. We need more diverse samples. And um, there was a paper that came out around COVID nineteen that was kind of like showing well, actually, like having more samples may not really make a difference um, if all the data is already biased. And so I think that that question is actually the wrong question. Is yes, there is a sample size issue, but there are also a lot of issues that go beyond just having the N. Right. There are a lot of issues that go with like the technology, even that we develop around, um, you know, studying diverse populations all the way down to the questions that we're asking. And so it's not just a, an in issue. It's also, you know, what are all the other things that impact it? And then the last thing I'll say is that the way in which we do when we talk about this and emerge is the way in which we do recruitment and way we want to engage with communities. We have to remember that it shouldn't be a transactional relationship where a participant comes and they give something with, you know, who also suffers through, you know, systemic racism in the healthcare system and all of these other issues. In fact, the paper that was looking at the uh, algorithm with the cost difference in hospitals actually talks about Henrietta Lacks and how this algorithm would have specifically impacted her and how she would have still likely died. And so I think that there are a lot of things that we haven't talked about, but I think we just have to shift the conversation to how can we make this, you know, impactful for everyone. And I'd like to add to that a little bit. So the, um, I completely agree with uh, the, what Janina was saying about being able to uh, reduce the bias by uh, being able to improve how we recruit and retain study participants. Um, and also on the other side of uh, developing algorithms, it's it's not always gonna be possible to get the, the biggest and the most diverse um, population. And so there's there's some research that we might, uh, or some approaches that we might be able to draw from uh, in terms of uh, like transfer learning or like ways that you can build a model in one site and be able to test it in other sites and refine it uh, so that it works with other subpopulations that we can, um, that we might be able to draw from in, in genomics research. Uh, also, um, a new new evaluation frameworks. I think that came up already, but uh, how we evaluate to um, this is considering models and algorithms versus individual gene variants. But um, how we how we evaluate them would uh, should in, you know include uh, the impact on different subpopulations and and potentially identifying whether like uh, you know if we're missing certain populations, how to refine for those uh, populations later.
Great, and, and I see in the chat also a, a lot of uh, back and forth and, and how, how do we gain trust? How can, is, uh, how could investments in, in um, improving that could be done in your opinion? Janina, why don't you take the lead on this one? Um, I think, you know, one thing I, I talked about before was, um, well, I talked about through this talk, and even I, you know, a person who works in this field, um, didn't really know the history behind our discipline. Um, I think that that highlights the lack of information that the public even knows about our discipline. Um, particularly, I can speak to African descendant populations in the US. Um, most of the engagement with genetics is typically around genetic ancestry, which if we think about sociology, sociology like, so, uh, like why that interest is and why people are interested in it, it's also connected um, to racism. But I think that we don't have a lot of transparent conversations um, with participants on exactly, you know, what it is that we're studying, why we're studying, and what if there is a benefit and being honest if, you know, maybe we don't have a benefit yet. I think um, a lot of times when we see and we think about data, data always benefits the researchers. When we get data, we publish, when we get data, we get grants, we become more successful in our careers. As a minority person, if you give data, does your health outcomes improve over time? Do, what is the benefit for you? Um, and you don't really see that benefit. You know, you, you see that in fact, you give data and you actually still become a victim of, you know, these systemic racism practices in the healthcare system and in the world. And so I think if we can start to think about one, how do we be transparent and communicate, you know, even some of these uncomfortable conversations around why we even need data is one place to start and eliminate the transactional relationship and by doing that, we have to really sit and think about, well, what are the benefits that we can give to our participants where they see the value of data and giving data the same way a researcher sees the value of receiving data? Those two things should be equitable. The, these two things should be equitable. The person using the data should benefit equally as much as the participant, particularly when participants are being um, disproportionately affected by some of the systems and practices in place that may have even founded the discipline as, as, as it starts. So that's a very simplistic answer to a very complicated question. <laughs> and, yeah, I think uh, there's a, there was a really interesting um, point there that um, uh, I, I have to admit has eluded me. Um, we've worked very hard uh, in our system to create a partnership between our participants and the researchers and tried to um, establish the type of value proposition that you're describing. But when we you know, talk to uh, people about why they're choosing to participate in research, uh, the dominant theme, and I think this is relatively generalizable, is one of altruism, uh, that I don't you know, I may not benefit from this, but this may be something that will benefit others. It may be something that will benefit my children or my grandchildren. Um, but to, in some ways, that's a very privileged answer because it reflects a background where we probably have actually experienced uh, that type of transfer of knowledge that has in fact benefited us from prior work. Whereas I think in other uh, um, uh, populations and cultures that has not been the case. And so to expect that somehow, um, you know, altruism will rule the day and that will somehow lead to increased diversity is likely not the case, in which case we really have to re-examine that value proposition um, to make it equitable because we're not starting at the same place. And to add to this idea of um, supporting a value proposition, uh, there's there are there is an opportunity to you know show at least say how how individuals who participate in research have con have contributed to science and uh, there's there's a, a value and appreciation by returning result or returning um, you know what's been disseminated from the the data that they've contributed and so so that also requires rethinking our 
research infrastructure a little bit because um, there would have to be some kind of link maintained between the participant and the research that they're, they're participating in. And, uh, and so by doing that, that does add another layer of risk, risk for um, participants to some extent, but, uh, but really like talking to people and knowing like, is there, is, is the, does the benefit outweigh the risk in this context? And should there be ways to, um, to provide updates regularly or to uh, allow study participants to say like, you know, if they're findings in these areas, then they would wanna know about it because their family's affected by this. Um, there's of course like a large um, bio, bioethics uh, conversation on this topic, but I think those bioethics con con uh, conversations could also go hand in hand with some uh, you know, technical conversations on how to support those processes. Thank you so much. I would like to pass back to, to Rex to conclude this session. Thanks. I, I, I guess I would be remiss if I didn't point out based on this conversation here that one of the grand challenges that the NIH, uh, NHGRI put forward was the concept of removing race from genomics and uh, genomic medicine. And I think that's going to be a very interesting challenge for us all to work on, uh, but I think it's an, an important one. I think uh, we've heard a few themes that we can think about as, uh, and I'll build on um, uh, Jeff Ginsburg's great comment in the chat, but um, we need to, in the light of thinking about removing a race from genomics and genomic medicine, we need to make sure we're paying attention to the heterogeneity of the health systems that are engaged in our research, not just major urban medical centers, but also thinking about you know, smaller health systems and uh, rural systems, we need their participation as well. We need to pay attention to the heterogeneity of the populations that we're uh, engaging in all of our research. And I think uh, Janina made the great point that we need to be constantly testing for bias and racism in our data sets to make sure that um, we're using the best possible data and even using it to fix and remedy the injustices of the past. So I think a lot of really great uh, discussion in this session. And um, I think we can turn it back over to the uh, Ken and um, Mark uh, as we go into a break. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much to the speakers and our co-moderators. I thought this was a wonderful session to start off with. And also thank you again, Dr. Green, for giving us the update on the strategic vision. So we now have a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll give people time to get up, move around and think about this session and we'll reconvene at 1.55. Um, thank you everyone. Um, well, for Mark, is there anything else you wanna, you wanna add before we close out for the session? Nope, we'll see you uh, in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you.